Okay, we're going to start off at verse 37. It says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate was confused. Jesus saying, Yes, but not of this world. So Pilate asked him again, Are you a king? Jesus answered and said, You are correct. He is a king. First Timothy 6.13 I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and behold Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. So First Timothy said that Jesus gave a good confession when he said, You're correct. I am. Okay? That was a good confession from the Lord. Jesus said, To this is the reason I was born. Jesus' mission wasn't, wasn't a political one to get to Pilate and all them. His mission was a spiritual mis- mission to receive the loss. He was to testify of the truth by proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. What people do with the message of truth, that is the word of God, is up to them. They decide where they want to spend eternity. And that's what Jesus did. He showed them the truth. Now, it's, it was up to them, and it's up to us now. Do we want to accept this truth? He says, everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Voice. We can hear his voice. Christians can hear his voice. Why can we hear his voice? Because we've got the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit in us can, interprets and gives us what the Lord wants us to hear. The Holy Spirit. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Luke 9.35 And there came a voice out of the out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Did it say to hear anybody else? It said to hear him. We got many people listening to others. But right here, God says to hear him. Hear Jesus, his beloved son. That's who we need to listen to. And how do we hear him? Through the word of God. Through the Bible. Through teachers and preachers. That are truly men of God. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Is going out and doing your own thing, is that following the Lord? Like I said, don't raise no hands or anything. But how, how many of us go out <coughs> and do our thing? And we do the Lord's thing on Sundays. How many of us do that? Monday through Saturday we do our own thing. The Lord says, if you hear my voice, you follow me. That's seven days a week. Verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Pilate continues to to be confused, because without truth of God in you, there is no truth. There is no truth in the flesh. We're in la-la land. Seriously. Well, because we got the, we hear this, we hear that, we we don't know who's telling us what, and we're just confused. And who's the author of confusion? Satan, the devil. So without the Lord, lost people have no truth. So they are constantly confused. Paul couldn't see the truth; he couldn't see it. But the truth was standing right in front of him. Can you imagine Jesus Christ standing right in front of us? Ah, right here, Pilate was, was right in the presence of Jesus the Lord. The truth, the life. In John fourteen six, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man can go to the Father but by Jesus. Not through any other, what people call saints. You can't get to the Father through saints. You can't get to the Father through a woman either. It doesn't say by a woman or saints. It says you can only get to the Father but by me, through Jesus. Paulus says in this verse that Jesus is innocent, that he finds no fault at all in him. This was no threat to Caesar that Jesus had a kingdom somewhere, like he said. But the kingdom wasn't here on earth. So that was the only accusation that Pilate had to investigate. Out of the three that the Jewish leaders gave him, 
The only one they had to check was, okay, is he a king? And Jesus said, I am, but not of this world. Legally, okay, legally the trial should have ended. Right then and there it should have ended. Because when he said, I find no fault in him. He's being judged. He's standing before a judge. And he says, I find no fault in him. Right there, right there, court should have ended. But we'll see that the chief priests continued with their accusations. They didn't want it to be over. As far as Pilate was concerned, it was over. He said, I find no fault in him. But because of the religious leaders, they didn't leave it alone. Now we're going to continue in Mark 15, verses 3 through 5. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answereth thou nothing? Behold now many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Pilate, as a man standing in front of him, being accused of many things, and Jesus wouldn't even defend himself. <clears throat> wouldn't even defend himself. He had said everything that he was going to say. Because when he said, are you, are you the one? And he said, and Jesus said, you are correct. He answered him who he was. But Pilate just keeps on. So Jesus is not saying anything else. He's already answered him. So now we go to Luke chapter 23, verses 5 through 11. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirred up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. The Jewish leaders started a new accusation that he was stirring up the people. They couldn't get him on the three they gave Pilate, so they started another one, saying he was stirring up the people. And we're going to see later who is really stirring up the people. They're saying Jesus is, but we're going to see later who is. Verse 6, When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the men were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. This was legal to do. But Pilate, but Pilate really wanted to get rid of Jesus because the high priests and them, they were giving him such a hard time. So he was happy to say, oh, but send him to Herod. If he's a Galilean, then Herod needs to take care of him. <clears throat> this made the religious leaders very happy because Herod, Herod is the one who had John the Baptist's head cut off. So when they said, well, I'm going to send him to Herod, I'm sure the, the, the religious leaders were excited because they knew what he did to John the Baptist. So they were thinking, oh, we got him now. And in verse 8, and that talk, it talks about that in Matthew 14, 6 through 10, if you want to look that up. But in verse 8, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to see some miracles done by him. Herod had a more experience with the Jewish religion. He was, he was closer to the Jewish religion, and he knew, he knew more about them. And for a long time, he had desire to learn more about Jesus because he heard of. Remember, these Jewish, these Roman leaders, they knew exactly everything that Jesus was doing, because this was Rome. Nothing happened in Rome without the governors knowing what was going on. And this was probably the reason Herod was in town because he knew of the Passover. It was the weekend of the Passover, and that's probably why he was in town. In verse nine, then he questioned with him in many words. But he answered him nothing. Remember back in John 18.34? It says, Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? I believe what Jesus is doing, he's saying, Do you want to know for yourself, or do you want to know as a judge? Is this personal? Because if it's personal, Jesus was going to witness to him. But if he was wanting to know as a judge, then he was just going to keep quiet. Here, Jesus is not speaking because of Herod. He, he's, he's already heard the word of salvation by John the Baptist before he had him beheaded. Herod heard this, the, what John the Baptist was preaching. So he already knew. And Herod has already rejected him. He rejected John the Baptist, the word of God. He was rejecting the word of God, not John the Baptist. He was rejecting the word of God, the salvation of God. And here Jesus, he's is doing the same thing 
So Jesus doesn't even, the, Jesus doesn't answer him because he's he's saying, well, you've already heard the plan of salvation. So why am I going to say anything? In verse ten, and the chief priests and scribes stood, shouting violently, ac- accusing him. Before I go any further, remember this is a judge who's supposed to protect the innocent. That's what judges do, right? Protect the innocent. Uphold the law. And he's getting ready to take part on what's about to happen. The judges. And in verse 11, And Herod with his men, Herod with his men, with his soldiers, set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. Now the word naught here means they were saying he's a zero. He was nothing. Mocked him. They, they treated him with scorn. They made him feel worthless. Now Herod was taking part of this. Not only his soldiers, but he was doing the same thing. Now this is a judge doing this to Jesus. Making him feel like a zero. Making him feel like he's worthless. And the reason Herod sent him back to Pilate was because he couldn't find where Jesus had done anything wrong. Here is the second trial with the Romans. And they couldn't find an accusation to hold against him. So in Luke 23, verses 13 through 16, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me, as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, and have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod. For I send you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Now to please the people, to please the people, he has to do he he did what verse sixteen is getting ready to what we're getting ready to read. Just to please the people. Because he's he's already said, We found no fault in him. So if you don't find no fault in him, what do you do? You let him go. But verse sixteen it says, I will therefore chastise him and release him. Why are you going to chastise him? Because he thought maybe that would satisfy the people. Even though he found no fault in them, even though he was an innocent man, because of the religious leaders, he says, well, let me chastise him, and maybe that will satisfy him. Again, the trial should have ended right there, but it didn't. They had Jesus innocent, but still whipped him. And these whippings, most men died from them. If you read them, you know, like history books, that talk about the Bible and these whippings, most men would die from these whippings they gave because they would bleed to death because the whip had sharp objects on it. And when they would whip them, it would tear the flesh off their back. And most men would bleed to death. And this is what they did to Jesus. And because of the people shouting, kill him, he did what it says in Mark. Okay? Let's go to Mark, chapter 15, verse 6 and 7. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whosoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which laid bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. But Barabbas was like a terrorist to the Romans. He wanted to bring them down. And while doing so, he killed some of them. And they're putting Barabbas up for the people to choose. This was legal to do, but... It says he can release one of the two convicted men. Jesus was never convicted. The law was, okay, I can release one of the two of the convicted men. Right here, or again, the Romans are doing illegal. Jesus was never convicted, but, so he couldn't be up there as one of the convicted men. All, I mean, everything that I've been teaching for the last two weeks in here, everything's illegal. Everything. They, I mean, this is how bad the Jews wanted Jesus dead it, he, where Pilate even broke the custom that was their custom but he broke it by letting an innocent man be one of the ones that the people would choose and in Matthew's chapter 27 verses 17 through 22 therefore when they were gathered together Pilate said unto them whom would ye that I release unto you Barabbas or Jesus which is called Christ for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Pilate wasn't an idiot. He knew why they had Jesus over there. 
Because like I said, they knew what was going on in town among the Jews and how Jesus was doing this and how people were following him. He knew the religious was le- leaders were doing this out of envy. He knew that. He says it right here. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. In verse 19, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Another word for judgment seat is bima. The bima judgment, which is going to happen at the end of the year, at the, in the last days. Remember, I taught you that in the last days, the bima judgment. Which, which Jesus will be doing the judgment then. But the judgment seat was a raised platform to give sentence in the court. And this is what he did. He was raised up on a, on a platform. Jesus has a judgment seat in the Bible, like I said, in the last days. But it's for Christians. The judgment seat is for Christians. In Romans 14.10, By why doest thou judge thy brother? Or why doest thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now he's talking about brothers. He called them brothers. So he's talking about Christians here. Christians are going to stand before the judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So there's going to be a lot of Christians. Christians! That are going to be standing before the Lord on the judgment seat for their good and their bad. Now there's going to be a lot of Christians who are not going to receive much reward. There's a lot of Christians that are going to be, be there who are not going to receive. In fact, probably the only thing that's going to happen to them is they'll make it to heaven. There's rewards in heaven, you know. But there's a lot of Christians who are not getting any rewards. Because, like I said, they're down here and they do their thing Monday through Saturday. And on Sunday, they're Christians. Now, we're talking about Christians. Christians do this. All right? And the lost people do it too, but Christians do this. And so the Lord says, whether they're good or bad, I'm going to judge you for it. These men are judging now along with all the lost. And by Jesus, we will, he, he will appear before the, this judge. And all the lost people, Jesus will appear before them at the great white jo- throne judgment. Remember I told you about that? That judgment is for the lost people. Now that one, that's where Jesus says, hey, you rejected me, this is where you go. Alright? That's what's going to happen there. In John 5.22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So who's going to be doing the judgment? Jesus. Right now those judges are judging Jesus but one day Jesus will be the one judging them. Amen? Amen. Revelations 20 verses 11 through 15. I'm going to read this out of the Living Bible. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from its presence but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Praise God. Praise God that we are not going to be at this judgment. Amen. Amen. I mean, look what's going to happen to them. I don't see how people can make fun of hell. This is nothing to make fun of. But it's going to happen. It's the word of God. And Paul's wife is also a witness of who Jesus is because of what she said. She said, this just man. What was she saying when she called him a just man? She said, this man's innocent. He is who he says he is. He's innocent. Even Paul's wife saw that. So we have Judas. Remember, Judas is the one who portrayed him. But later on, he realized, hey, he made a mistake. 
This is the Son of God. Remember that? So Judas recognized him as being the Son of God. Herod and Pilate, they said, we found no fault in him. So they see he's an innocent man. And now his wife is saying he's an innocent man. But the trial keeps going on. The dream she had, or vision, it was from God. It was from God to help warn these men of what's, what's about to happen. The Lord allowed this dream to come to his wife. And she even warned her husband of it. Verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. It was the chief priests and elders that were getting the crowd stirred up. They were blaming Jesus. But right here it says, they persuaded the, the, the multitude. So they're the ones who was in the crowd stirring them up. And they were stirring them up to say, hey, crucify Jesus. We want Barabbas released. Verse 21, the governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the train will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. They wanted Barabbas, who was a robber. In John 18.40, it says he was a robber. And in Luke 23.19, he says he was a murderer. And he did much more. But that's who Pilate is willing to release just to get the Jews off his back. He was ready to release this man who killed Romans and robbed and did, like I said, did more. Verse 22, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. What Pilate says here, What shall I do with Jesus? That's still going on today. Still going on today. People have to decide, what am I going to do with Jesus? I, I, like I said, the Bible says, the Lord will enlighten every man's heart. Every man will hear about Jesus. And when he does, this is going to be the question he's going to have. What am I going to do with him? Am I going to accept him? Or am I going to reject him? That's, that's the same thing still going today. Pilate says, what am I going to do with Jesus? And that thing is, that question is still today. People don't know what to do with Jesus. Accept him or reject him. And as we know, most people are rejecting him. They didn't want Jesus to be stoned to death. Know why? They wanted the death that was painful and slow, where he would suffer tremendously. Get stoned. I mean, pretty much, you get the right, the right rock hit you in the head, you're dead. But here, being crucified, hanging on the cross, nailed to a cross and hanging there, and you can't even breathe. That's what they wanted for Jesus. That's how much they hated him. No, no, we don't want him stowed to death. That's too quick. We want him crucified. That's how much they hated him. Like I said before, the reason they hated him was his teachings went against their traditions. Do y'all hear me? His teachings went against their traditions. And that also hit their pocketbook. How many churches, how many preachers are out there because of the money? Hmm? So if you have a man that comes around speaking the truth, the word of God, if it's going to hit their pocketbook, they don't want this man around. And I'm, I hate to do this, but I'm going to give this as an example. Catholics make a lot of money on statues. The Catholics make a lot of money on the statues. They don't want nobody saying here, hey, the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments says we shouldn't worship statues. They don't want to hear that. Because it's going to affect the pocketbook. The Word of God showed the people who they really were. The Word of God showed the people who the religious leaders really were. In fact, they didn't just show it. Jesus said it. He said they were hypocrites, vipers, snakes, and blind guides. That's what he said about them. And this is why they hated Jesus so much. The scriptures say in, in John, right after, they, right after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead... And we're going back a little bit. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, this is what the the religious leader said in John 11, verses 45 through 53. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus, Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we 
For this man doeth many miracles. Now the religious leaders are saying this. They just heard that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And plus they said, this man does many miracles. Verse 48, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So they admitted Jesus did miracles. Right here, they admitted he did miracles. And they knew he raised Lazarus from the dead. Especially that one. Raising a man from the dead. They didn't want to lose their power. They didn't want to lose their power over the people. And they didn't want to lose their political power with the Romans. This is why they hated Jesus. The scriptures say it right here. Verse 49. And one of them named Cyprus. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Being the high priest that same year said unto them. Ye know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us. That one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together. For to put him to death. Now the high priest. He wasn't there to flatter the, the, the religious. His brothers. His religious brothers. Because he says up here. You know nothing at all. He's telling his religious brothers. You know nothing at all. And he says either Jesus dies. Or the nation shall perish. And of course he was proposing. That they kill Jesus. When he said I am not speaking this of my own. He prophesied that Jesus was going to die for a nation. Okay. Now right here. We have a wicked. He's, he's a wicked high priest. If you read the before all this. He did a lot of bad things to the Christians. To the disciples. He was a wicked man. A wicked high priest. But right here he prophesied. That Jesus was going to die for a nation. So this right here shows. Hey. Jesus can use wicked men. To tell you what's what's what. And what are they called? Wolves. You know these men that are wolves that are in it for the money. Or just for their own glory. You know. They're, a lot of times they're up there. They're speaking the truth. They're speaking this. The word of God. But their motives are wrong. Their motives is to get money. You know Jesus heals. Oh they push that one a lot. Because people they like that one. That, that teaching. But they're using this. The word of God. To put money in their pocket. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what kind of signs and wonders he does. Because the devil does the same thing, right? Like Moses, when he threw his staff down and it turned to a snake. Well, those sorcerers did the same thing. They turned into snakes. So signs and wonders, that doesn't mean anything. You don't come to the Lord through signs and wonders. What's the Bible say? You're drawn by the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you come to the Father. Through Jesus. And the key to recognizing a wolf. Is what does he say about Jesus. That's the key to recognizing a wolf. What does he say. About Jesus Christ. Here we're going to. We're going to go. <clears throat> we're going to know about Jesus. Through the scriptures. In Acts 17.11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonians. And that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And searched the scriptures daily. Whether those things were so. This is the way we're going to know. The wolves. Like I've told you many times before. They were noble. They were more noble. They were sincere. In their Christianity. And that they received the word. With all readiness of mind. They received the word. Of God. With all readiness of man. And they searched the scripture. To see. If these things were so. Whatever the men told them. They searched the scripture. To make sure this was so. That's the only way we're going to. Know who a wolf is. We check them out. How many times have I told you that? Don't go and take a man for his word. The Bible says. It's better to put your trust in the Lord. Than to put your confidence in a man. Remember that. Always remember that. 
And when he said not for the Jews only, what he was saying in a wider sense, he was referring to the salvation of the Gentiles. That's what he was talking about. We see that the religious leaders knew who he was before all this even took place. This is why they plotted to have him put to death. They already knew who he was. They plotted long before this trial even got here. They had already plotted to put him to death. Now let's continue in Matthew 27. From verse 22, we're going to continue with verse 24 and 25. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. See ye to it. Pilate saw that he couldn't change their mind and that a riot was about to start. That's what he was saying. Now Pilate did. Now Pilate knew he was dealing with the Jews. So when he says, I'm washing my hands of this, he was doing what it says in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, verse 21, verses 1 through 7, it says that someone who is murdered and you can't find who it was, if someone is killed, and you can't find who it is, you go to the nearest town, wherever this body is found. You go to the nearest town and get the elders of the town. That's what it says. You get the elders of the town and you get a cow and you cut his head off. That's what Deuteronomy says. And as you're standing next to the slain man, they wash their hands over the cow and they say, our hands have not shed this blood. That's what, that's what they did back in the Jews. This is what they did. Back in Deuteronomy. And Pilate knew this. And that's why he said, hey, I'm washing my hands of this. Like I said, he, was, he knew he was dealing with the Jews. Pilate knew about the Jews. So he said, okay, I'm going to tell them something that they can understand. He says, I'm going to wash my hands. I am innocent of this blood. Now, Pilate didn't get a cow, but they knew what he's doing. Okay? Again, again, Pilate is calling him innocent. This is the judge. He is the judge. And he keeps calling this man innocent. He keeps calling Jesus innocent. Then he says, the responsibility is yours. That's what he tells him. Then in verse 25, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and our children. Okay. The Jews, should Jews be accountable for his death? Because right there, right here is saying, if it comes on us, then it's going to be on, on us and our children. So let's see, did the Jews really kill Jesus? Was it the Jews that really killed Jesus? First of all, from what we studied so far, it seems, yeah. Right. You arrest a man, you make accusations to get him, you take him to court, and you want him to be put to death. So we figured, yeah, the Jews is the one who killed Jesus. Let's see what the scriptures say. Acts 2, verses 22 and 23. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel of foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So who's he talking to? Verse 22, ye men of Israel. Ye, he's talking to the Jews. He said, you Jews, and then it's the last part of verse 23, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So right here it's talking about the Jews, right? Yeah. The Jews killed them. The scriptures have a, already shown you that the religious leaders saw wonders and miracles Jesus did and in verse 22 like I said men of Israel he's speaking about the Jews these men and people today they they know what they're doing people today know when they reject just like they did here the religious leaders men today they know who they're rejecting but their power I don't say power uh, the will they want the will is so strong for them to please themselves that will to please himself is stronger than to please the one who died for them. So 
But these today is the same thing as these men here. They knew who Jesus was. They saw his miracles. They saw the wonders. They saw all this and still rejected him. And that's even today. Now, signs and wonders, like I said, don't save us. But Jesus, Jesus is alive today. And he has shown himself to the people. And he's supposed to be doing it through us, the Christians. But we're doing a poor job witnessing to people. We are doing a poor job. When I say we, I'm talking about Christians in whole. I'm not just saying here, us in this room. I'm saying Christian as a whole, we're doing a very poor job of telling people about the Lord. That's our ministry. And we're doing a poor job at it. The, the servants of the devil, they're doing a much better job than we are. Jehovah Witnesses, door to door. Hmm? They take their Saturdays, their Saturday. And you know how big Saturday is. People want their Saturdays. But these guys are going door to door on Saturdays. And who else is going door to door? The Mormons. And if you listen to the CD and you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, he's calling the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses a cult. Yes, I am. And if you want to know more about what I'm saying, then call the number on, on the CD. God already knew that they were going to do this. Jesus also knew that they were going to do it because of what he says in John when he came into Jerusalem. John twelve twenty seven. Now my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. So Jesus knew. Jesus knew what the Lord brought up, uh, what his ministry was to do. Jesus knew because the parable he gave in uh, Luke, which these two verses he's speaking of himself. In Luke 20, verse 13 and 14, the parable is about the world and, and his prophets and his son. The, the Lord in this parable is God, and the vineyard is the world. Okay? But in verse 13, this is a parable. Verse 13, Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? Remember, this is God saying of the world. What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. Now, the verses before this, they killed. They, he sent other uh, men to the vineyard. And they, they would beat him or whatever. They even kill him. So right here in verse 13, he said, well, let me send my son. Surely, surely they will reverence him. That's what God is saying. Verse 14, But when the husbandmen, leaders that are lost, that's what it means, husbandmen, saw him, they, received, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. We know who the heir is. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So Jesus was already, he was already showing them. He had already showed them that they were going to do this. Reject them. Another verse we can see who killed Jesus. This is about 50 days after they killed, killed him. Peter and John, they've been arrested by the same bush, by the same bunch of people who killed Jesus. Acts 4, verses 5 through 10, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priests, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what I'm saying. When you go to witness to people or, or when you go somewhere and you don't know what to say, Christians, listen. The Holy Spirit will give you what to say. We don't have a plan. We don't make plans. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say no. Just go and do it. The Holy Spirit will give you what to say. Just like here. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deeds done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. Who, who killed Jesus? Who's Peter talking to? 
He's talking to the rulers, the elders, and the scribes. He's talking to the religious leaders. And he says, Whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand before you whole. But we got all these verses I'm showing you right now. Who killed Jesus? Jewish. The Jews. That's what it's showing, right? That's what we're reading. So we say the Jews killed Jesus, right? But wait a minute. Let's read one more verse, okay? Acts 20, I mean Acts 4, verses 25 through 28. Who by the mouth of thy servant David, talking about King David, has said, Why did the heathens rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of the truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. It says that King David prophesied that the kings of the earth and the rulers got together against the holy child Jesus who was anointed by God. Then it tells them, then it says, who were these kings and rulers? In verse 27, it says it was Herod, these rulers and these kings were Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, and the Jews got together to kill Jesus. Hmm. So who killed Jesus? We did. <laughs> That's who killed Jesus. Because unless, unless, unless you're born again, you were right there hollering and crucifying. You hear me? And before we got born again, we were in there. We were in that boat yeah. saying crucifying. Before we got born again. So who killed Jesus? We all killed Jesus. Yes, it showed the Jews did it, but right here, this one, this one, these verses right here showed that we all did it. Now let's continue with, with the trial on Mark 15, verses 16 through 19. Does that surprise y'all? We're thinking everybody's thinking the Jews killed him. The Jews killed him. The, Jew, the you know. But you read these verses right here. It says that uh, Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, that's lost people, and the Jews. So in Mark 15, verses 16 through 19, it says, And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praturium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smoked him on the head with a, reed, with a reed and did spit on him and bound their knees, worshipped him. The Old Testament gives a better description of what they did. This is what they did, but the Old Testament says in Isaiah 52, 14, it speaks about the Lord's suffering. And I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible. It says, His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. This is what they did to our Lord Jesus. Right here, these verses I just read, and they smoked him and all that. The Old Testament prophesied what they were going to do. And it says that they were going to beat him so bad that he would be disfigured and he would, even, he would hardly seem to be human. That's in Isaiah 52, 14. Like I said, I'm reading, it says it in, in the King James, but I'm saying that I live in the Bible because it gives, it, it, we can understand it better. It says he could hardly be seen as a human. This is how bad they beat Jesus Christ. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. That's how bad they beat Jesus Christ. This man that we don't have enough time for. And I wish other people were hearing this. People who were not here. That's who really needs to hear this. This man who was beaten so bad that he didn't even look like a man. You could hardly even tell he was human. That's how bad they beat him. This man that we don't have enough time for. This man that, okay, I'll go to church on Sunday. That's good enough. Do y'all hear me? Yeah. And at any time, he could have called down the legion of angels, right? Yeah. That's what the Bible says. At any time, he could have done this. But did he? No. You know why? Because he says, Brandon, Lindsay, Jody, I love you so much. 
I love you so much. This is what I'm going to do. Our Jesus. Our Jesus. They beat him so bad. I knew I was going to have a hard time with this one. But I know this is real. And that's why I get emotional like I am. I know this is real. I know they beat my Lord so bad. He didn't even look like a man. So why do I give all my time to him now? Because he deserves it. Do you hear me? Because he deserves it. Now it says they worshipped him. Now in the Bible, anything you bow your knee to, in the Bible, anything you bow your knee to is worship. 1 Kings, verse 19, 18. Yet I have left me seven. I, now, this is a story, but I'm just showing how when you kneel, that's worshiping. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. They did not worship. So these 7,000 mouths did not worship. Baal. And it showed that they didn't worship him because they didn't bow their knee to him. Bowing your knee means to worship. The same event was put in the New Testament in Romans 11 4. But what said the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Bound your knee to whatever is worship. We have people, and it says to kiss. We have people who kiss religious men's hands. I've seen it. And you know what I'm talking about. They'll kiss their hand. I've seen people do this. That's worship. They are worshiping this man. Even a kiss. They feel, they feel like it's spiritual if they kiss this, this, the hand of a man who's supposedly be holy. Do you know, do you, do you know what I'm saying? The Bible says that's a sign of worship. Will you come and kneel to me? Will you come and kiss my hand? No. Why not? The Lord called me to do this. You think I could do this on my own? The Lord called me to do this. So I'm called by God to do this. So why don't, why don't you kiss or kneel to me? Are you a respecter of person? God isn't. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm trying to show you. I, you take me a retired free OLA guy teaching the Word of God. Put me next to whatever pastor you want to. Do you think the Lord looks at him as greater than me? No, he gave us both a gift. He gave the pastor a gift to, to preach and the pastor a church. It's just the same as he's giving me a gift to teach the Bible. Now, why do people go to pastors and almost worship them? I mean, if you're going to do it to him, then you might as well do it to me, right? I mean, that's, that's, the way, uh, that's the way it is. But we don't do that. Why? Because we only worship one. And any man, any man, if he is a man of God, will not accept worship. Do you hear me? If this is a man of God, he will not accept worship. He will not allow you to kiss his hand. He will not allow you to worship him. These preachers, pastors, priests, whatever they are, if they allow this, they are not men of God. Because even the angels say, huh, don't worship us. There's only one. So when you see, if you go to a church and you see them kissing the hand of the preacher, the pastor, or whatever, the priest, they worship that man because it says it right here in the Bible. If you do this, you worship that. Now let's go to John. John 19, six, verses 6 through 15. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate says unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Pilate, who has said many times, This man is innocent, tells the religious leaders to kill him yourselves. And that's what he's telling them. Now, if a judge proclaims a man to be innocent, and then he tells the people who brought him, Hey, you go kill him. But the judge has said this man is innocent. And he's telling them, you kill him. What is, what is he allowing? Murder. It's murder. He said the man is innocent, but he's saying you go kill him. So what he's saying is, I'm allow, allow you to murder him. 
Do you see this? Yeah. I mean, <sighs> I'm glad the Lord gave me this to, to, to teach. Verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law we ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. I think I said we. It's he. He ought to die. Remember, first they brought three accusations against him. And the only one they investigated was, Is he a king? Right? But now they're saying, But now, since, since the Romans didn't put none of those against him, they say, okay, he's a king, but he's not a king of this world. So that don't bother us. So now, they're saying, he is the son of God. In verse 8, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more afraid. Pilate, <laughs> a lost person. Pilate had an idea that Jesus was different. He knew something was different about Jesus. But now he knows. Because these religious leaders saying, he claims to be the, the Son of God. That He is the Son of God. That they claim. Non-believers, they know that there must be a God. Non-believers. But they don't know, they don't want to submit to Him. Pilate knew. He knew. But if he would have accepted this, if Pilate would have accepted Jesus, known who Jesus was, when they said this, he was more afraid. He knew who Jesus was now. But... If Pilate would have accepted Jesus as his savior, he would have lost his position in the Roman government. He would have lost his power. This is the very reason many people today will not accept the Lord. Because of what they'll lose. When I was lost, had all these friends, I was popular, I didn't mind losing that at all. This is what I had to lose to become a Christian. But I did it with no problem. But people today, just like Pilate, Pilate recognized them. He got afraid when they said that because he knew who Jesus was. But he didn't do anything. He didn't accept Jesus because he would lose his position as being a Roman governor, a judge. Y'all hear me? Same thing is happening today. People do not accept Jesus because of what they would lose. They might lose their popularity. You hear me? They might lose being famous. Verse 9. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. And the reason Jesus didn't answer him back, because in John 18, 36, he told him about him being a king, but not of this world. He already told him who he was. He says, I'm a king, but not of this world. So he didn't answer him because he already told him who he was. Okay? That's why he didn't answer him. In verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speaketh thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Now that one, Jesus couldn't be silent on that one. Okay? When he said that, Jesus was like, Oh no, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm putting it in, in English here. Verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldn't have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now this shows that everyone who is in authority down here, presidents, whatever, the Lord has let them, has allowed them to have that authority. The Lord has allowed them to have that authority. The world is wicked. Remember that. The world is wicked. And it's wicked men who are in authority. Now listen to me. It is wicked men who are in authority. These presidents that we have, and oh, he's a Christian because uh, he, he's a religious person. Remember, world, the world thinks religion is Christianity. We know it's not. Genesis 6, 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Talking about the world. He said the wickedness is of man was great on the earth and that every imagine of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually this world is full of darkness this world is full of darkness now you think this world full of darkness is going to elect a godly man that's walking in the spirit that's walking in the light 
Then now that's, does that go together? That's just common sense right there. Do you think they're going to allow a Christian man who walks with the Lord to lead them that are walking in darkness? Right? right. <sighs> the leader of this world is the devil. That's who the leader of this world is. Ephesians 2.2 2, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. This is the way we walked before. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience, that is the world. So the world's king right now is the devil. The world's king is the devil. Now you think you're gonna, the devil's going to put a man of God in authority? Am I, am I making this pretty clear for y'all? Yeah. Jesus says, He that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now, who delivered Jesus? Some, some of you might say Judas. Judas is the one who delivered Jesus. No, Judas delivered Jesus to the Jews. It was the religious leaders who delivered Jesus to Pilate to be put to death. So it wasn't Judas. It was the religious leader. Here, the greater sin means it's just the worst sin. Because we know in the Bible, sin is sin, Right? In God's eyes, there is no greater sin. But the word greater here means worse. Sin is sin. If I lie, the Lord looks at that as a, as a sin. If this guy over here kills someone, how does the Lord look at that? As a sin. But which sin is worse? Lying or killing somebody? So, do you understand what I'm saying here? Just because it says it's a greater sin, there's not levels of sin. There are sins that are worse than other sins, and that's what it's talking about here. All right? Because sin, everybody pays the same for whatever sin that is. Yeah. The reason the sin was greater on them, it says, was because they knew. These religious leaders knew the scriptures. They knew God. They knew about God. And they knew the scriptures. And supposedly, they were Christians, supposedly, right? Because yeah. they were religious leaders. But God says their, greater is, their sin is greater because they know me. Verse 12. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying. If thou let this man go. Thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king. Speaketh against Caesar. Now this is the second time. He wanted to release Jesus. Now many times he said he's innocent. But this is the second time he wanted to release Jesus. But what did they do? What did the religious leaders do? They threatened Pilate's job right here. This is a king. If you let this king stay king, then we're going to go tell Caesar. And you'll lose your job. So Pilate, like I said, didn't want to lose his job. Verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour and he saith unto the Jews behold your king but they cried out away with him away with him crucify him Pilate said unto them shall I crucify your king the chief priest answered we have no king but Caesar these are the religious leaders they said we have no king but Caesar Right here, the Jews, up until this moment, they always pronounce God as being their king. Up until this verse right here, the religious leaders always pronounce God as being their king. Now they're saying Caesar is their king. This is how bad they wanted Jesus dead. That they even went against God. That's bad. Yeah. I mean, that's wanting him dead pretty bad. They've already rejected the Son. They've already rejected Jesus. Now they're rejecting God. John 8.42 Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father. So Jesus already knew. Jesus already knew that these religious leaders didn't have God as their Father. Okay, because He says it. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. We see through the scriptures that the religious leaders just acted like they loved the Lord. 
through the scriptures, they acted like they loved the Lord. But they didn't accept Jesus, his son. And then they wanted him dead so bad, they rejected God. And I'm going to say this, the Jehovah Witness, they're the same thing. Jehovah Witness love God, Jehovah. That's why they're called Jehovah Witnesses, because they only believe in God. They believe Jesus was just a prophet, a man, just a prophet. And right here it says, if you don't love Jesus, you don't love the Father. So right here, I mean, Jehovah Witnesses, if they don't accept Jesus, then how can they love the Father? Yeah. Now the last verse in Matthew 27, 32. And as they came out, they found a man named Simon they compelled to bear his cross. They found a man to carry the cross. As they came out. As they came out from where? Well, in Mark 15, 16, it says that the soldiers took Jesus to the courtyard of the governor's headquarters. So Jesus has been in the courtyard all of this time. The governor's headquarters. Which was called the Praetorium back in the 15, 16 of Mark. Now, if you watch movies, or even preachers, they talk about Jesus carrying the cross to the hill. Right here it says, as soon as he came out of the courtyard, a man, they got a man, Simon by name, to carry the cross. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Because when you watch movies, they got Jesus going through the town, carrying the cross, right? And you, like I said, you, not only moves, but you got preachers who teach this. But right here it says that as soon as he came out of the courtyard, that a man named Simon, by name, carried the cross. I just thought I'd throw that out there. All right. This is who our Jesus is. Okay. This is who our Jesus is. People who hated him. People, not just the religious leaders. Those people out there hollering, crucify him. Same thing. People who hated him, they hit him, they spit on him, they mocked him, they wanted him to suffer as much as you could suffer as a man, and they wanted to kill him. And guess what? This is who Jesus came to die for. All this that we have studied, these religious leaders, the people are saying crucify him, we'd rather have this robber, this killer, freed instead of you, Jesus. This is who Jesus came to die for. People like that. People like us before we were born again. We know, everyone is in here know how we were before. This is who Jesus came and died for. I mean, I don't believe we were this bad. But he died for these people right here also. If any of these people who spit on him, hit him, beat him so bad where he didn't even look like a man. If any of these people would have repented and said, I want, I'm accepting you as Lord. They would have got salvation. This is our Jesus. Amen? Is He good? Is He worthy to be praised? That's the trial of Jesus.